Hi. Um, okay, sounds like the mic's working. Uh, well, so yeah, welcome to a talk on rapid iteration of hardware prototypes. What, uh, what I mean by that is, I sort of break that down into two broad categories. There's this process of doing a build, getting that into users' hands, learning from them about what worked and what didn't, and then cycling that back into your next build. And then there's how to actually do each build quickly. How do you move uh, from point A to point B cheaply um, so that you can get your product out faster? So we'll talk about both of those. Uh, I didn't know they were gonna do a whole intro on me. This is me when I was six. Um, I'm fixing, I think that's like a little train car or something. So I really have been from a very young age, anything I could get my hands on, trains, Legos, tree forts. Um, after college, I didn't really know what I wanted to do with a degree in civil engineering. Uh, this was a laser scanner that I built at a startup in London, which is where I figured out that somebody would pay me for doing what I did in my free time. After that, I've only done hardware startups, mostly a lot of solar. This is a low factor solar concentrator I worked on, some really cheap solar panels I worked on, and then I still do random stuff in my free time, a little walking robots, that's a clock that tells me when the next bus is gonna show up near my apartment, and it's super useful. Um, and uh, that's a gingerbread cathedral. Uh, every year for Christmas, my friends and I try and make something that shouldn't be made out of gingerbread, out of gingerbread. Uh, as he said, about four years ago, I joined Athos. This is me fairly early on, experimenting with something. There were, there was, at the beginning it was uh, just four of us. And we've now grown to about 50 people. Uh, three years ago, I'd be, for the last three years, I've been the head of the mechanical engineering team. We've gone through three rounds of funding and raised more than $50 million. So, uh, it's a really fun ride. Athos, these are our two co-founders. This is DJ, that's Chris. This is them sort of in the, in the basement at Waterloo University. Uh, you can just barely see DJ has a breadboard taped to his back. He's doing a very early prototype of this. And they weren't trying to do a startup. They were interested in a way of tracking performance in the gym and seeing if they could improve their form. And when they couldn't find anything, they decided to make one themselves. And the technology they settled on is called electromyography, or EMG. So basically, when your muscles activate, they put off a very small electrical signal, very, very small electrical signal. And if you're careful, you can pick that up, and if you know what you're doing, you can process that and turn that into some useful feedback. If you've ever seen somebody on a treadmill with a bunch of wires coming off of them, that's EMG. It's been used in medical and research fields for a long time. We do that, but we do it wirelessly and in the form of a shirt or shorts so that you don't have to change your workout. We do all this so that we can build better athletes, faster, stronger athletes. And so you translate that EMG signal into insights on training load, on form, balance, so that they don't get injured, so that they can run farther, faster, and the product that we actually make and sell is this performance base layer. We integrate EMG, soft EMG sensors into it. And those sensors send the signal here to this core. It's a removable core that attaches to the garment. The core processes the signal, filters it, amplifies it, and wirelessly sends it to your phone where you get some, you can see a live view like this while you're working out, and then we also track performance over time. So, well, before we get to the traditional hardware development process, let's figure out who's in the room. Um, who here is, has a background in hardware, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, firmware, anything like that? Okay. Who here is at a hardware startup that has shipped a product. 
Okay, shipped a second version of your product? Third version? Okay, yeah. <laughs> um, great, okay. So, sorry. Huh. The traditional hardware development process. There's a bunch of different ways you could break this down. I don't want to get into like the nitty gritty of it, but just so that uh, when I reference that we're all on the same page, it looks roughly like this. Idea, concept, prototypes, iterating on those until you've got a prototype that does what you want, works the way you want, looks the way you want, then you tool up, then you go into production trials, validation and testing of those trial products, iterate on that until you've worked out all the little bugs in the product, all the bugs in the process, and then production and then selling. It's a fairly linear process. Who here has put out a product that sort of using this method? Any problems with that process? It takes too long. <laughs> okay, takes too long. Anything else? It's expensive. Um, if anybody's ever made uh, hard tools molds for plastic parts, that's twenty to fifty thousand dollars a pop. And the thing you don't see in here is user testing. You might get a little bit of sort of uh, focus groups or something in here, but basically from here on, and then maybe you'll get some beta testing in here. But uh, it's fairly devoid of input from users. And so the product you come out with may meet specifications, but it may not be what users want. So, this real, use back, real user feedback cycle is about getting your product out to users to find out what they want. And the scrappy prototyping is so that you can move quickly. So why is it worth moving quickly, cheaply? Anybody? Seems fairly obvious, but it's worth setting it up front. No, no one wants to answer? Right. Man, you're already answering the next question. <laughs> um, no, that's good. Yeah. So, right. So you want users to tell you what users actually want, um, and you need to move quickly because, as a startup, every day that you exist, you burn money. So. The faster you can move from A to B, the better. Okay, let's start with this real user feedback cycle. So when I say, as if, when I say this, I mean fast, like putting out new product once a month, which is very non-traditional. Who here remembers Google Glass? Yeah? <laughs> um, so massive company, all the resources in the world, they come up with this idea, they iterate it furiously internally, they're gonna revolutionize the world. They come out with it and it flops. Users don't like the way it looks, it doesn't have functionality that users want, and that's understandable for the first time you release a product. If it's the first time users have seen a product, there's probably some things about it that users aren't gonna like. That's fine. Preferably you haven't spent hundreds of millions of dollars on it like Google did, but that's actually to be expected. You shouldn't expect to get your hardware product right the first time. And so the ultimate sin that Google committed was, in my opinion, was that they've basically now dropped the project. They put it out there, they said, oh, people don't like it, they're not ready for it. And now it's sort of, maybe it's bouncing around X Labs somewhere, but it's basically gone. But they didn't have to do that. Snapchat came out with these glasses last year and has actually had some success with it. So if Google had kept iterating on the design, they could have gotten to this point before Snapchat. And this has also opened up a whole new field of um, augmented reality. This is a test that Boeing ran. That's a wiring diagram up in the corner that the glasses show while in real time while a technician is trying to wire up a connector. 
So it's not the application Google expected. They expected all of us today to be wearing these, probably be you know, sending me cues on what I should be talking about next. But uh, it turns out that the applications are more in the realm of commercial settings. And so BMW has done some tests with this as well. But Google's not getting in on that. It's a bunch of other companies. So this is roughly what the cycle looks like. Do a build, get it out to real life use, learn from it, repeat that monthly. So let's start with build. Minimum viable product. Who here has read The Lean Startup by Eric Ries? Okay, excellent. If you haven't, I highly recommend it. It's very short, very easy to read. You can even skim it. And what it is, is he's talking about what is the simplest version of your product that you can make that distinguishes your product from everyone else? What are the features of your product that make it essential to users or different from all the other competitors out there? So when you're figuring out what you're going to build, the first part of saving time is not building things you don't need to put in it the first round. So this is some plastic shells from uh, some early rounds of our making the core that I was working on. And we, we hired a design firm. They did a very good job with a number of features of it. One thing they wanted to add was a little hidden LED. So if you make the plastic, you make it very thin in one area over the LED. When the LED is off, you can't see anything. When the LED turns on, it shines through the plastic. It's a nice idea. Um, I like the way it looks. I, I like the engineering challenge of making it work. And, and we did get it to work. But this, these are all the different plastic pieces I had to make. There's dozens of iterations of different materials, different pigments, different amounts of pigments, different thicknesses of plastic. And that's, that, but that didn't help us get our product out. Our product helps improve athlete performance using EMG, not by using fancy hidden LEDs. So we needed an LED. There needs to be an LED that turns on and off, battery, Bluetooth connection, those kinds of things. But we could have used a simple, regular LED. And if we wanted to, later on in the next iteration, add something fancy like this. So I should have, other people should have pushed back on this and we should have done it later. Instead, I wasted a bunch of time trying to get this to work instead of getting something functional to work. I see some of you agree with this. We're sad, we're sad that that's the truth. Yeah, right. Um, and you know, it, it's, right, like, I like this idea. It looks great. I'm not unhappy that I spent time on it. I just shouldn't have spent time on it then. Um, so, it's about setting priorities. What do you need first? And then we'll add this in Gen 2 or Gen 3. Um, so the next part, real life use. And I think the important part here is real. So uh, at Athos, whenever we come up with new builds of the garment or the new builds of the app, everybody uses it internally, which is absolutely what we should be doing. Uh, we've recruited our friends into helping us beta test things. But what we also did is we've contacted everybody who has already ordered a product or earlier on everybody who had pre-ordered a product to see if they would like to be beta testers for us. Because you need people that, the people in this room were engineers or were the founders. We created the product. We love it. We know every in and out of it. And we are not the real users for this. Who here watches Silicon Valley on HBO, right? Do you remember this? So this fictional startup comes up with this compression algorithm. They send it out to all their friends. Everybody tests it. This is the user interface which is, that they come up with. Everyone loves it. They release it out to the public. And suddenly, nobody can figure it out. Because they tested it with a bunch of engineers who knew the technical aspects and not a bunch of, not people from the public who don't know what this means. So real users testing it, and probably Google Glass had a similar thing, right? You test it internally, everybody inside Google says, oh yeah, this is great. 
They're inside Google, they're drinking the Kool-Aid, and I don't mean that in a disparaging way, like I drink the Kool-Aid at Athos too. Um, you're at a startup, if you're not drinking the Kool-Aid, you should be well, somewhere else. Um, they're excited about it, they're engineers, they're programming things for it, but when it gets out to the public, the public is, Google is not representative of the public. The people at Athos are not representative of the public. Um, at Athos, we are all, we tend to be more athletic minded, but you know, we're selling this to pro basketball teams, and sadly, I don't play pro basketball. So, go Warriors. Yeah? No, okay. Um, <laughs> man. Um, okay, so uh, I'll come back to learn in a bit. This is the whole cycle, and this is sort of what it looks like at Athos. This is uh, one of our uh, engineers, Guido, testing out some new design of a shirt. So we come up with an idea. We do a couple of prototypes with this, like this, in-house. We iterate on that until it works. Once we're happy with that, we make two or three garments. We test those in-house. Once we're happy with that, we build 10 or 20 garments at the factory, send those out to users, and by this point, we should have reasonable confidence that those, whatever changes we're making, are going to function properly and they're not gonna break down in the first use. But it is still experimental. So we iterate on that a couple times once 10 to 20 users, real users, are happy with the changes we've made. We set up low volume production. Um, maybe make a soft tool, depending if it's, we're making some plastic changes. And then we make 100 garments. And we send those out to beta testers. And once 100 people have had a reasonable success rate, you're never gonna satisfy everybody, but we're not seeing any defects. We're not, you know, users are happy. They, they, they see how the changes are improving the product for them. Then we roll it into production. And the nice thing about this process is because we have gradually increased our volumes in beta testing, by the time we want to roll it into production, the factory already has some experience with this. We've already worked out some of the bugs. So the, the testing and pre-production and validation uh, cycles from that traditional process sort of get looped into this all in one. And so the numbers here may not you know, be right for your startup. If you're doing some fancy medical equipment, maybe you're only making five of them in the end. Or if you're doing much higher volumes, you probably want to produce more than 100 parts before going into production. But you, have, you can figure that out for yourselves. This was not what we were originally planning on doing. We were originally planning on doing a sort of traditional one year hardware release cycle, even for the garments. But in order to get our, prod our garments out quickly, initially, we decided one, to make it hand wash only, instead of machine washable. And we just sort of made the sensors and the mount in the garment work. The mount is where the core attaches. We just needed something that worked, right? Back to the minimum viable product. It didn't need to be machine wash. It didn't, people weren't buying it because it was machine washable. They weren't buying it because it was super comfortable. They were buying it because it gave them EMG feedback as they worked out. So that's what we did. And then we released it to, to customers and we started to get feedback on what they liked and what they didn't like. And there were a bunch of different improvements that we wanted to make to the garment, but the feedback we got was that this is a very early version of the shorts. There's wires coming off of it. We're gluing sensors on using C-clamps. Um, whatever works. Um, the feedback from users was that they really didn't like, it was really uncomfortable, and that they really wanted it to be machine washable. They really wanted just to be able to work out, take it off, throw it in the laundry, it's ready the next day. So that changed our priorities about which aspects of the product we were going to improve first. So we prioritized making it machine washable and making it comfortable. And in the two years that we've been shipping uh, the garments, we've probably released 16 or more versions 
of the shorts to customers. Now, some of those are evident to customers when we change the mount. They probably saw that pretty easily. We've made some changes internally to it that definitely made the garment better, but the user wouldn't be able to see it. They wouldn't be able to identify that it's better. So our first garment, hand wash only, not very comfortable. Some people compared it to wearing a wetsuit. Now you can machine wash it, you can machine dry it in fact. Uh, it's made out of a breathable fabric. We haven't gotten complaints about comfort in a long time. And we've also, de at the same time, we managed to decrease assembly time on the line. And if we had saved it up for that one year release cycle, we probably would have accomplished half of this a year ago and we'd just be rolling out the next set of changes. Now, the problem with this is that when you're doing this rapid cycle of doing a build, releasing it to beta testers, you are releasing something that is sometimes not going to work. And people were very concerned about customer satisfaction, uh, how that would affect our brand image. And what surprised me the most is that customers are incredibly tolerant of minor defects in the product. Who here has heard someone say that before? <laughs> right. It's probably never been said in the history of consumer products. But it does hold true for early customers for two reasons. They like your product because they get to be the first. They want to be a trendsetter. They want to have something that nobody else has. And your product is providing a, a benefit to them that they can't get anywhere else. And that matters more to them than aesthetics or than a battery that has to be recharged, you know, only works for one workout and then has to be recharged or has to be reset every couple days to work. So we follow three rules for keeping beta testers happy. We're honest and upfront with them about what they're getting. We're not shipping this just to a regular paying customer. We're shipping this to people who have been expressly told um, and volunteered, in fact. Um, you are getting an, uh, a test product. It should work fine. There might be some bugs. We'll help you through that. And so they then get to decide, well, no, I don't really want to do that. I'll just take whatever the current production version is, or I'll wait until you have that version out in production, or yes, I want it early. You show improvement. So what they want is, what customers, testers want to see here is to know that their feedback is making its way back into the product, that it is that they're being listened to and that that's helping to improve the product further down the road. And so, you know, we've got people who probably, who pre-ordered our garments and probably haven't ever received a production ready version because they volunteered to be beta testers early on and we have just kept sending them whatever the next latest version that we're testing is and they're very happy with that because they're, they get to affect the product in a way. And the most important part is amazing customer support. This is our customer support team, Juliet and Amanda. That's at our Christmas party. They don't usually dress like that. Um, they have covered for so many engineering problems simply by providing good customer support to people. And really what they've done is they've given Athos uh, cover to put out products early that are going to have some problems, but so that we can get feedback on how on what users think of that product, and then so that we can incorporate back into the next version. And even to the degree where people who have come in with problems who are who are unsatisfied and are basically ready to return the garment will come away from interactions with them more loyal to Athos than if they had never had a problem at all. So it was, it, this has been one of the more surprising things to me at Athos. We probably didn't hire them soon enough. We should have had more customer support earlier on, but 
they have really been done a fantastic job of helping us with the testing. And they become the closing the loop on this cycle to get feedback from customers, to help us learn from customers about what they like and what they don't like. Because without that, this whole cycle sort of falls apart. You need to be learning from customers to feed it back into the next version. So now we have a process for figuring out what users want. For who's heard the term product market fit? OK, right. So the goal here is to get product market fit. So that's our process for getting it. Now we need a process for actually doing each build quickly. So what I'm talking about here is I'm not talking just about 3D printing or laser cutters or using Raspberry Pi. Those are fantastic tools. We use them a lot. But plugged into that traditional development cycle, they're only going to speed things up a little bit. Really what I'm talking about here is challenging conventional wisdom about how you develop a prototype, how you answer questions, the, how you answer the technical or functional questions you have about your product with faster and with less time and less money. So challenging accepted wisdom. This is almost cliche in Silicon Valley at this point. I mean, it's been applied to everything under the sun around here. But a lot of hardware startups continue to use the same process for developing hardware. And I, Frank, at, at Athos, we started out doing that as well and have now moved to something else. This is a hard tool for liquid rubber molding. Who here has done, anybody done liquid rubber molding, injection molding before? Okay. So this is the mold. This is the part that comes out of it. It's basically a massive machine. Uh, this is hardened steel tool that they machine the mold out of. It goes into a massive machine that injects the rubber under super high pressure. Well, depends. the pressure depends. Um, and then they heat it up to cure the rubber so that they can pull out a solid part. My second week at Athos, we were trying to improve our, our soft rubber EMG sensors. And we wanted to test out different sizes, different geometries, see if we could get a better signal. And the normal way you would do that with liquid rubbers is this process. It's, you're doing a hard tool, so it's probably four to six weeks of lead time and probably twenty to $30,000 or even $50,000 to make one tool. And then once you've got that tool, you're stuck with it. If you want to make a change, you have to machine a new one. So that wasn't really going to work for us. So we wanted to do it in-house. And so we decided, we broke it down into three basic areas. We needed to make a mold in-house. We needed some way of getting the rubber into the mold. And we needed some way of curing the rubber. So what we ended up doing was we got a local machine shop to machine the mold out of aluminum. Turns out that the rubbers are slightly more viscous than honey. And so it seemed like we might be able to inject it by hand using a syringe and a really fat needle. And then for curing it, we were just going to use an industrial oven. You set the temperature, you set the time, you pop that aluminum mold in there, comes out 10 minutes later, you have your part. We were super excited about this. It was going to save us tons of time, hundreds, tens of thousands of dollars. And at the last minute, DJ says, well, why do we even need the industrial oven? Can't we just use a toaster oven? And my initial response was, a toaster oven would never work. The temperature dial on it is all kinds of all over the place. If you set it at 200, who knows if it's actually at 200. The temperature probably swings wildly up and down. But the thing about it is, a toaster oven is like 40 bucks on Amazon, maybe, and comes with free two-day shipping. 
So we can find out if this works in two days and for 40 bucks. And if it doesn't work, we can always fall back on a slower, more expensive process. And that holds true for so many scrappy solutions to prototyping. If you've got a cheap and, and quick idea for solving a problem, you can find out if it works quickly and cheaply. And if it doesn't, you really haven't lost that much. So it often becomes worthwhile to just try out something, even if it's only got a 50% chance of working, because if it does, you've saved a lot, and if it doesn't, you haven't lost that much. So this is the toaster oven. There's, uh, might be a little hard to see, there's a temperature probe coming out of it. You can see the aluminum tool inside. It worked beautifully for several months. Actually, we, we prototyped different versions on this. The local machine shop would just make, sometimes he'd actually change a, an aluminum tool that he'd already made for us to try out different geometries. And then once we were ready, we rolled that into, uh, we actually went to injection molding with the $20,000 tool and all the time and stuff. But that was at a time when that was appropriate. So what we were doing here is we were simplifying down the question. This is sort of a prototyping version of minimum viable product. What is the question that we needed to answer by making these sensor prototypes? We didn't need to demonstrate that it could be produced at volume. We didn't need to demonstrate that they could be produced cheaply. We needed to figure out a way to try out different shapes and different sizes of the sensor. And so we removed all the parts of the prototyping process that didn't help us answer that single question. Uh, another way of thinking about prototyping Scrappy that has helped me is solving the problem backwards. Usually we think of it this way. This is sort of the traditional engineering. You have a problem, there's a process for solving it, and you come to a solution. But that process, the, the typical process you might use, in this, in this case for the sensors, injection molded rubber uh, at a, using a big machine, that sort of limits you to a certain way of doing things. And so it is sometimes better to think about it in reverse. What's the problem? What is my ideal solution? If I could, if I have a magic process and all the resources in the world, what's my perfect solution to this problem? And then think, how do I get that? Um, a really quick example of this, I was working on a, a solar concentrator and I had this crazy shaped heat sink I needed to make. And so normally traditional process is normally heat sinks aluminum, usually extruded. Okay, I could extrude aluminum and machine it or I could do uh, cast aluminum to get this crazy shape and that would be my solution. But on a Lark what I thought was wow this part would be really easy to make if I could injection mold it as plastic. But of course plastic has terrible thermal conductivity and would make a shitty heat sink. But just on a whim I did a Google search for thermally conductive plastic and it turns out that some companies do make them. They're not nearly as conductive as aluminum but with that design freedom of now being able to do injection molded plastic, we could actually make changes to the heat sink so that the plastic would work for us very well. Um, and so then you don't always end up with your ideal solution, you'll end up with some actual solution, but that thinking about the ideal solution can help you come about the problem from a different way. So, an example where we didn't challenge accepted wisdom, and I really wish we had. We went to mass manufacture in Asia as soon as our prototype was done. And really, we didn't need to. Again, our product helps improve athletic, athlete performance using EMG. What we needed to demonstrate was that athletes would find that useful we did not need to demonstrate that we could mass produce in Asia. We didn't need to demonstrate that we could produce the thing cheaply. And so what we ended up doing was we spent a bunch of time setting up a high volume process, 
paying for expensive plastic tools, expensive uh, circuit board assembly lines to run in volume, and optimizing all those things because if you're going to make 100,000 plastic pieces and you can shave off five cents from each piece, that looks like it's worth it. But if it's your first or second product and you're only going to sell 10,000 of them in a year, if you're lucky, shaving off five cents isn't the thing that's going to make or break the company. So, and it also creates additional headaches. This is us, this is the VP of hardware, Hamid, that's one of our interns. It's midnight, we're in a hotel in Taiwan, we're frantically trying to make uh, some testers work so that pr production can continue the next day. And if we'd done production in the US, we could have handled this all locally. We could have driven over to the factory or one hour flight or whatever it is and done this much more easily. So the first thing you need to do is demonstrate that your product works with the bare minimum functionality. Then you need to demonstrate that you have product market fit and then you can worry about buying in bulk and getting your margins low enough so that selling the product makes you a self-sustaining company. So, again, idea, remove everything extra from the idea. Bare minimum functionality of what makes your product essential to users. Get it out to users early on, even if it's ugly, even if it's buggy. Get feedback from them, loop that into your next build, and keep going around until you're ready to, until you've got product market fit and you're ready to release into the product. And there's a lot more work after that, but that's a very different talk. So, any questions? Yeah? How do you know when you have product market fit? That is an excellent question. Um, that's probably a discussion for an entirely new uh, topic. I'd say product market fit comes in waves, right? So as I was talking about early users who like it because it's the functionality gives them some benefit they can't get anywhere else. So there are people who, for Athos, um, you know, they're data nerds. They really like that we're providing extra feedback. They track their heartbeat. They track all the calories they eat. And so that EMG is another metric that they can track on top of that. So getting product market fit for them was pretty easy. So that's one phase. That gets us some amount of, of, of volume that we can sell. But you want to expand it past that. So then you want to move to the people who are less interested in a specific metric and are more interested in, um, you know, how does this really help me perform better on the field? And so product market fit isn't like a light that turns on. It's more of a, you know, you find groups that find your product useful and you start from the people that are easiest and you work your way out, gradually expanding your market. Absolutely. Yeah, so, you know, uh, talking about beta testers and getting feedback, that's not just from beta testers. Getting it from customers who have, the great thing about customers is they've given up something for your product. They have made that, um, they are implicitly making a cost benefit analysis about whether your product was worth it. And so if you just do um, like a focus group, there's no cost to them. In fact, you're probably paying them to come in and tell you what they think of your product. So they can say sort of whatever they want and it doesn't matter. But somebody who's actually bought it is actually gonna tell you, yeah, your product's great, um, I think it's worth it. Or mm, it would be worth it for half the price kind of thing. Um, so yeah, and, and that's another place where uh, Juliet and Amanda are very helpful because they're our main touch point to customers. We can also, you can send out surveys, that kind of thing. It was an, yeah. Um, for the beta testing, I'm guessing you guys had pretty low volumes, um, and you made like, a ton of iterations. Right. Did you invest in any like hard tooling, or did you do that all with local CMs? Well, right. So this was the thing. Initially, we did do hard tooling, which was unfortunate. Um, since then, any new idea we have basically goes to um, uh, Proto Labs which is in Minnesota, they're fantastic. 
There is Model Solutions in Korea, also makes soft tools. They're great as well. Um, so there's really no reason not to go to a soft tool first. Um, and in fact, soft tools come in different flavors. You can do an aluminum one that's super cheap and has a fairly short lifespan, or you can do a pre-hardened one that is still much cheaper than a, a regular hard tool and has a little bit more life. And so that lets you do prototypes and get versions out to beta testers. And then, also once if that change is approved, you've got a tool ready for you to go into production right away. You don't have to do this three month tool up process to get ready for production. You're sort of, you've already started doing it basically. Yeah. Um, we actually were expecting more competitors to move into the space. There's some, but we've all been around for, for a while. We haven't seen any major new players. I think, so, so like I said, I think you, production product needs to be tested. When you say that this product is in production, that can't be experimental. You can't have doubts about the durability of that or whether or not it's going to perform the functionality that you say it will. But for, for testing, you're letting people opt into that. So the worst case scenario is uh, we tell a customer or pre-order, we get them into the beta test program, they try something out, they're like, oh, this is terrible, it broke right away, I don't want to do this anymore. We send them production garment that we know works, they don't have to deal with us anymore. Um, we've probably lost some people that way. I don't want to say that's gonna, that we'll be able to fix every problem, but the, the, the insights that we get from users are far more valuable than a couple of our customers. Yeah. Um, so specifically to the hard tools, that happened pretty instantaneously when the parts from the hard tool didn't perform as expected. Um, that was a terrible moment for me. Um, that was probably about $60,000 that I just incinerated. Um, and, and so as we went to redesign, so, you know, we had this scramble to redesign things and as we did that, we looked at this process and said, we're scrambling to redesign things and we're about to commit to six weeks of making another hard tool. And the money is painful, but the most painful part was that six weeks where you're just sitting on your hands doing nothing. So we went to a soft tool there, yes, because it was cheaper, but also because we could get that soft tool in a week. Um, I think more to your point, uh, with the garments, when we were saving up, um, saving up improvements to do a yearly release, you know, the sales team started coming to us and said like, well, you have a fix, why aren't you putting it in production? Which is fairly typical for sales teams to do that. And we were like, well, no, it's very hard to roll things into production and production's all set up and we don't want to change it. We want them to, to, to roll and, produ and produce things smoothly and efficiently. But again, that has a mentality that the most important thing at that time was smooth, efficient production, which it wasn't. We weren't trying to sell you know, half a million a year, we were still trying to get product market fit. And so ro rolling those changes in was more important. But that did take, you know, Hamid and I and the uh, CEO and a bunch of other people sat down and said like, well, can we release this? more than once a year. And we sort of relented and said, okay, well we can do, we've got a bunch of stuff saved up, we can do one roll in and then we'll do another one in six months. And then once we'd done ro one roll in to production of changes, it sort of was like, well, that was actually easier than we expected. Okay, well, let's, let's not be crazy about this. Maybe we can do another one in three months instead of waiting six months. 
And then each time you do that, it becomes clearer that it's actually not that hard. And so then we got to the point now where basically as soon as we have some changes that are ready to go, we work it into production. Yeah? How do you determine the volumes for the small scale production? Was it just based off of pre orders? Or did you uh, make like a set amount each month for each of those monthly rollouts? Um, no. So what we did is we. Um, part of it is based off of how many beta testers you can get. It's actually managing beta testers does take a fair bit of effort. Um, you've got to get people into the program, you've got to get them gear, you've got to monitor their progress, get feedback from them. If people aren't using their gear because they're they've stopped working out because they hurt themselves or they're on vacation or some reason, uh, you might need to get product back from them so that you can get it to a different tester. And what we, so part of it is based off of how many beta testers we have available and we'll have multiple beta tests going at a time. So we'll sort of collect ideas, put them into one garment, get that out to beta testers and then, you know, we let them test it from, for two or three months. But so the next month, we may have make a different garment that has a different set of changes that go out to a different set of beta testers. So part of it's based off of how many people we have and then part of it is based off of, you know, if you're doing a change, what, how many, uh, how much testing on that change do you need to make for you to be comfortable rolling it into production, right? So for 10 or 20 users, we're looking for it to be fairly reliable, but if it breaks or something goes catastrophically wrong, it's not a problem. By the time we get to sending it out to 100 testers, we should be highly confident that there aren't going to be any issues with that. Because that test is going to lead into production. And so if we do get any unexpected problems with those 100 garments, um, then you, you've got to pull the plug on those changes and sort of pull back and say, well, okay, so we jumped the gun on this one. We need to fix this problem before we can roll changes out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how do you handle uh, the certification process using production Yeah. Um, so FCC, um, or God forbid FDA, uh, does throw a bit of a, uh, a wrench in the works. So you can make very minimal changes to an FCC certified product without recertifying, but more likely what you're going to want to do is for those beta testers that you're getting product out to, you just can't charge them for it. So if you put out 100 or 200 or 300 product out to beta testers, you don't charge anybody money and it's not FCC certified, that's something that they're comfortable with, though you are, you are going to have to get those products back before you send them an FCC certified version. Um, but that will, that overhead of the cost of certification will uh, change how often you release new versions. So, and that's, that's a, uh, basically a determination you're going to have to make. You're going to have to say, well, I've got $20,000 to certify this. So, but this change is super critical. It's really going to, we think it's really going to open up a market for us. And the users who have beta tested it say that they really like it. So that's worth it for us. Or maybe you say, well, it's a small change. Let's save it up until we have, you know, 50 other small changes we want to make and then we'll, we'll release it. So yeah, you probably won't cycle as quickly there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's actually, you're touching on a very good thing about prototyping Scrappy is thinking about how accurate this prototype is going to give me an answer. How accurate is that answer going to be to if I built the actual thing? Um, and that again comes into a cost benefit analysis of, well, it's fast and cheap, but it's not going to be a very accurate answer versus it's slow and expensive, but very accurate. So you have to make that determination on the fly. Um, 
So the toaster oven concerns there were um, accuracy of the part, uh, tolerances. But as you start to think about it, you know, the human, this is a sensor that's reading um, muscle signal. So you've got the tolerances of how accurately the sensor is placed on the body. You've got the tolerances of a person who's sweaty or not, who, or who has a lot of arm hair or not. Um, men and women uh, have different amounts of fat under the skin, which changes the EMG signal. So yes, part tolerances for this toaster oven thing were, were lower, um, but on a scale that wasn't relative, was, was, I, I was pretty sure was not relevant compared to all the other variability that we were dealing with. Now, I could have been wrong, but, um, you know, it's, yeah, that's, that's it's something you just have to try out sometimes. Yeah. So the process, uh, I assume, were obviously that you put into the product itself. Yes. Um, so sorry, are you talking about doing changes that just improve production? Or are you talking about saying, let's not worry about production now, do the change and then... I'll, I'll give you, this is coming from a company sure. where making a prototype and there was a specific way of how we're going to build it. And then I'm trying to assemble it and fail it. And I'm like, man, somebody's going to have a real hard time setting their hand in this way. And yeah. then they need the eight additional fingers to hold this thing down. Or we have to make a very advanced jig. Or have this <laughs> Can we make this in a simpler way? Like, oh yes, there is. Where you just snap, snap, and then we're done. Sure. And that, let's use that because that's going to be easier for a bunch of people in China or Taiwan to actually put together successfully and have a better deal. That's what we're Sure, of course. Um, so uh, I tend to uh, not to think too much about exactly how it's going to get made when I'm prototyping a thing. Uh, I tend to focus more on the functionality of the prototype so that it produces as accurate an answer as I possibly can. But, you know, uh, you don't want to get super far away from, from any production process. And so, so it is sort of worth thinking about. Um, I'm actually, we're, we're, we're just making some prototypes right now where uh, yeah, I've sort of said, I don't know exactly how I'm going to connect this up to everything else. I know I can do it in prototyping, but I'm, I'm putting off that larger discussion to later. Um, but I am reasonably confident I can solve that connection problem. I just don't know exactly how. If I was nervous about that connection problem, uh, I would be spending more time on it. So, okay, I think we're, are we at time? Oh, eight more minutes, wow. Okay. Anyone else? Yeah. Oh, I'm going. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and this is, like, it is another kind of leading question, but in, in this process, works, I guess it goes back to uh, the tolerances and the ability to answer certain questions. Were there some parts of this where you really ended up like, this is a hard or a really important question about the product? Sure. Like you're just, we have to make this the real thing to really know whether it actually delivers this core aspect of the product. Yeah, so um, that core that I showed you a picture of that, that detaches from the garment, it locks into the core. There's a mechanical connection, there's an electrical connection. And the way we wanted that to work is any core that Athos makes works with any garment that Athos makes. So yoga pants, golf shirt, jacket, whatever, all our cores would work with that. So we could do different versions of the core, but they would all have to have a same mechanical connection, same electrical connection, um, sort of similar to like an iPhone and iPhone connector. So even though it was very early on in our design process, we knew that we would be stuck with this connection for a long time. And so we did put a lot of effort in up front 
to making sure that that worked well, to making the core small, because it was the way we were connecting was sort of dependent on the size of the core. So I actually am somewhat notorious around the office for having um, fought multi-day battles to shave off tenths of a millimeter, because I knew that we were going to be living with that tenth of a millimeter for, we still are living with it, so, yeah. Okay, cool. If you have others, I'm, I'm happy to talk to people afterwards. Um, but yeah, thank you all for coming.